Good, Good morning, morning everyone. everyone. Welcome to Integrity Church. We're so glad that you're joining with us today. Let's get started. She's Connie. And he's David. And we are so excited to continue our series, Advantageous. Let's now go into a time of worship and praise.
morning church it's time to take our offering and I just want to thank you so much for your faithfulness and giving this morning and during this Christmas season that we can continue to express our love and God's faithfulness in our lives so giving it's one of those tangible ways that we can just worship God so I would just want to encourage you and thank you so much for giving this morning there's numerous ways you can give you can give online uh, you can give on the app or you can send it through the mail but thank you so much for your giving this morning God bless you Hey, good morning. Thanks so much for joining with us today. Welcome to Integrity Church. From wherever you are worshiping with us, we are thankful that you're able to do that with us today. So this morning marks the last Sunday that we journey through Advent together before we celebrate uh, the birth of the Savior, Jesus Christ, on Christmas morning. How quickly this Advent season has gone by. We've been looking at the themes of, of hope and peace and love. And this morning, we focus our attention on the subject of joy. I like the fact that the Advent concludes with the theme of joy. I think it's very strategic because it's only through understanding that Jesus is our hope, that Jesus is our peace, that Jesus is love. It's only through our understanding of that can we fully appreciate that Jesus is our joy. The hope and the peace and the love that we have been recipients of is what gives us the joy that goes beyond our circumstances, that goes beyond our emotions, past our aches and our pains and all of the things that we may be experiencing because joy is tied to a promise. And even more than that, joy is tied to a person. And joy has a name and his name is, is Jesus, and that promise is fulfilled in the arrival of a son, a promise that is the essence of the Christmas story. We read about that holy night 
as recorded in Luke's gospel. Chapter two, it says, in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And Luke records, they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, a savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, those are angels, praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. What an amazing event that must have been. I mean, check out what Luke records here. It says, here they are, they are in the fields. And he says, the multitude of heavenly hosts, uh, the skies open up and they are hearing this singing that is going on around the heavens, declaring the glory of God. We have a snapshot of that also in the book of Revelation where we see that there's this angelic host that are bringing worship to the King of Kings. And the shepherds in the field that day catch a glimpse of something so extraordinary, so powerful, and so consistently taking place around the throne of God, the multitude of heavenly hosts singing glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those whom he is well pleased. What an extraordinary moment that must have been. But I want to take a moment and draw your attention to the humanity of these shepherds. To what may have been going on in their minds at the moment. Forget with me, if you possibly can, forget with me for a moment that you know the end of the story. Forget with me for a moment that you know what's going on. You know, sometimes our familiarity with the story can rob, of, uh, rob us of appreciating the context, the buildup of that monumental event. And so just try to forget that you know what's going on at that moment and place yourself in the sandals of the shepherds in the field that night. Here they are, they are doing what they normally do. They're in the field. It's nighttime. They're caring for, watching over, protecting the sheep like they had been doing day after day, night after night. But this night is different. It's unlike any other night. And an angel of the Lord appears to them and the glory of the Lord shines around them. Could you imagine with me for a moment what is going on in their minds? In the midst of this very ordinary moment, Luke records for us, it becomes a moment of intense fear. It is an ordinary moment. They are doing what they have always been doing. And something is introduced into the ordinary moment that resulted in them being filled with what Luke records being great fear. They were filled with great fear. Perhaps you can relate with that today. Perhaps you know what it is to experience a sense of calm one moment and the very next moment, a wave of intense fear fills 
your heart and your mind. You're in the midst of an ordinary moment and the phone rings, the door is knocked upon or some news is announced and your ordinary moment is filled with fear. That's what's going on at this moment in the field that night with the shepherds. These seasoned shepherds of the field on this ordinary night, they experience something extraordinary and they're filled with fear. But, but we do know the end of the story. There's an announcement that follows this feeling of fear that filled their hearts at the moment. The angel says, fear not. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Notice what's going on here. The first thing that happens in the hearts of these shepherds, it says, and they are filled with great fear. And the first words to come out of the angel's mouth is fear not. 365 times in the word of God, we see those words, one for every day of the year. You wake up, you put your feet off the bed and onto the floor, and there's a fresh new fear not for your day. The first thing that the angels did was calm the fears of these shepherds. For these shepherds, who are filled with fear, their fear is now dispelled with the declaration of great news, of great joy that has come for all people. I love what the angel says, fear not for you is given Christ the Lord. The angel redirected them from focusing on their fear. And instead of focusing on their fear, they focused on the message of good news, of great joy that is to come. And this joy has a name and his name is Jesus. I want to encourage you today that if you're here and you're listening and you're struggling with fear, I want to remind you that God's word is there to inform you that you can fear not because God is with you. He will never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He loves you. He knows your frame and he will walk through your day with you. The angels redirected them from focusing on their fear and said, we bring you good news of great joy for Christ has come. The arrival of the Christ set the stage for great joy to be experienced even in the midst of some of the most difficult of times. You know, any surface study looking at the the lives of the disciples during Jesus' time, any surface study would demonstrate that while his coming was miraculous, while his mission was clear, while they turned the world upside down, it was not without horrific hardship. I mean, all of his disciples, save John and Judas, of course, would be executed for their faith in Jesus this this one who brought joy to the world. Consider the early church that was, was scattered and, and persecuted for their, their commitment to advancing the gospel. Many of them lying, laying down their very lives for the sake of the gospel, the, the good news of great joy. Even today, our, our brothers and sisters all around the world are suffering under the heavy weight of persecution, on the run for their lives, for their commitment to Christ. Many of them facing daily persecution for this, this good news of great joy. Why 
would they do that? Why for centuries would the church push through the hardship, push through the torture and the the heartache and the hunger and the pain and the isolation? Why would they face rejection and imprisonment and their very lives for this joy that had come to the earth? Because the good news of great joy, which began in a town called Bethlehem, will find its fulfillment at the end of time as we know it, when we find ourselves safely in the arms of Jesus, our Savior and Lord. The writer of Hebrews captures this joy that motivated Jesus to willingly go to the cross for you and for me. He writes in chapter 12, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. Look, he says, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. The call to the readers, uh, the, the, these readers was to look unto Jesus, the author or the, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. What was the joy that was set before Jesus? It was you. It was me. You see, it was the only way man can be reconciled back to God. Jesus had to go to the cross to take upon himself the punishment for my sins so that I can be reconciled back to God, so that I can be with the Lord forever. And Jesus, knowing there was no other way, he looked and saw you and me. And for the joy set before him, he went to the cross for you and for me. And I submit to you, there was nothing happy about that moment. Listen to Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane. Father, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but, but yours be done. I submit to you that the, the, the going to the cross was not a happy time for Jesus, but it was one that was full of joy because he knew that what he was doing on the cross is what would enable you and I to be with him forever. Good news of great joy because of what Christ has done for us. And good news of great joy is not bound by time. Instead, it is, it is over time and it, it extends into eternity. The coming of Jesus was not a promise of great happiness. It was a promise of great Joy. Joy goes far beyond happiness. Happiness is dependent upon our circumstances. Joy is tied to a person. Joy, while certainly involving emotion, is not defined or dependent upon emotion. Joy is tied to hope. Joy is tied to peace. Joy is tied to love. And joy has a name, and his name is Jesus. And so what does that mean for us here now? Does that mean that as Christ followers, we're kind of just kind of sit and sulk, just waiting for joy to come? Of course not. In this life, I have joy, and so do you. My joy goes beyond my circumstances. I am blessed to experience joy in part, in the many ways that God has chosen to bless me. Many of the blessings of being a child of God and being the recipient of God's goodness and grace has allowed for me to enjoy the joy 
of my journey. But in this life, I experience it in part. But there's coming a day where all that clouds the reality of joy will be gone. And we will forever be in the presence of our Savior, rejoicing with one another. A place that will be void of pain. A place that will be void of fear. A place that will be void of sickness and sin. And the joy that the angel forecast in that greeting so many years ago will come to fruition. This good news of great joy that is found in Christ our Lord. Our Lord. Joy that my sins are forgiven. Joy that I've been reconciled back to God. Joy that God knows my name, that God knows my frame. Joy that God loves me. Joy that God knows when I'm in the midst of hard times and joy in knowing that God is with me in those hard times. Joy that my hope is is unshakable, my peace is immovable, and my God is reliable. Joy has a name, and his name is Jesus. Joy to the world, for the Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room, and heaven and nature Sing This hymn, written by the late Christian minister Isaac Watts, was published in 1719 and has distinguished itself as being the most published Christian hymn of the 20th century. But what's interesting about this hymn is it's not about Christ's birth, which we often sing about, but it's about Christ's second coming his triumphant return, the second advent that still awaits us. Joy to the world, the Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ, and while fields and floods and rocks and hills and plains repeat the sounding joy. I bring you good tidings of great joy that will be for all the people. That's the shepherds in the field, and that's you and I today. Joy has come, and joy has a name, and his name is Jesus. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Will you sing it with us together? Joy to the world.
thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I hope you were blessed in the same way that I'm sure me and Connie both were. Definitely. Uh, we are excited to see you next week. Please tune in. And also we have a Christmas Eve virtual service. So look out for that. We are so excited and we're excited to see you next week. Love you guys. Have a good one. See Bye. You later.